Open your Bibles this morning. Turn to Job chapter 40. We're going to be in a couple chapters, Job 40 through 42, a little bit of 42 this morning as we come towards the end of our series in the book of Job, Job chapter 42. If you need a Bible, you can reach down and grab one in front of you there. We've got pew Bibles available, and you're welcome to take that home with you. If you need a Bible, we would love to give that to you as a gift for you here this morning. There was a lawyer, I read a story about a lawyer from Charlotte, North Carolina. It's a true story. He really thought he had outwitted the system. He purchased a box of very rare and expensive cigars and then insured them against a number of things. One of the things he insured them against was fire. Within a month, having smoked his entire stockpile of 24 cigars, the lawyer filed a claim against his insurance company, and in the claim, the lawyer stated that the cigars were lost in a series of small fires. This is a true story. The insurance company refused to pay, citing the obvious reason. The man had consumed the cigars himself. An insurance claim against fire damage cannot mean the same thing as fire whereby he himself had consumed the cigars. The court sided with the lawyer, however, and he won. And the reason why he won is because the court said, it's true, this is frivolous, this is ridiculous, but it was never specified what the fire insurance looked like. And so the lawyer won the case and the insurance company paid the claim. To the surprise of everybody, they had to pay $15,000 to the lawyer for the 24 lost cigars in the fires. The lawyer was rather proud of himself for his clever deed, and afterwards, he cashed the check, and the insurance company then had him arrested on 24 counts of arson. This is awesome. With his own testimony used against him, the lawyer was convicted of intentionally setting fire to insured property 24 different times, was sentenced to two years in jail in a $24,000 fine. That makes you want to clap, doesn't it? Someone finally got what was coming to him. Well, that guy thought he was so clever, and his own testimony was used against him. As we go through the book of Job, we find a man who God called righteous, and he really was righteous in so many different ways. He was a man of a pure heart. He really tried his best to live for the Lord, and God put him through so many things and so many trials, but as the trials continued and began to ramp up, what we see is a pride oozing out of Job's heart as he was squeezed by the trials and the suffering that God put him through. And what ends up happening is Job condemns himself with his own words. And here's a couple verses that we've studied already from this uh, book. In Job chapter 31, verse 35, he says, let the Almighty answer me. Let my opponent compose his indictment. God, come on, I'm ready for you. I am innocent. I'm ready to meet you in court. And Job's asking to meet God in court. And then his tone changes a little bit as God approaches him in Job 38 and 39. We read in Job 40, verse 5, I have spoken once, I will not reply twice. How can I add anything? And Job says, I am simply just going to put my hand on my mouth and stop talking at this point because he has indicted himself. He's said enough. He has no further to say, and sometimes we just need to put our hands over our mouth when it comes to talking against the Lord because God is always wise and God is always right. He's always just and he's always fair. And we didn't know that before we dare speak against him. This is where we left off last week, Job chapter 40, as he says, I'm going to cover my mouth. He hasn't repented yet, and so God has more to say to Job. And up to this point, God still has not answered the question of evil. God's not answered Job's question of why these things happened to him. And God's not going to give a full answer to that. But what God has done is he's pointed to creation. And so Job says to God, I want to know why this has happened. I want to know the answer to the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And God's never answered the question. Instead, God just speaks to Job and he points to creation and he says, Job, do I look like a God that has things out of control? Do I look like a God that has not figured everything out? Do I look like a God that maybe has missed some details? Job, just look at the creation. Do you really think I'm a God that missed something or that something's gone underneath the radar? I don't think so, Job. Look at how I designed the world. Look how I designed the animal kingdom. And he's going to do that one more time for us in these chapters. And in fact, he's taken Job to a trip to the zoo. And he's gone through all these different animals. And now in these last two chapters, all he does is focus in on two animals specifically. 
We're going to look at these two animals this morning in Job 40 and 41. And what it does for us is it confronts in our minds the problem of evil. And as God is talking about two specific animals, they are in a sense symbolic as well of evil that we cannot contend with. And friends, let's just be honest with each other. Evil is frightening. Even though God is in control, even though God has designed this world, even though we believe that God is navigating and controlling every detail of His creation, we can't escape the fact that evil is still difficult and frightful. I don't know about you, but I hate hearing stories about oppressed people. I hate hearing stories about people that are going through difficult things. Even just this week, there was somebody in our church that got a very difficult diagnosis medically. And our hearts just break with families like that. I was talking to another pastor friend this week that has a family in his church, and they have a two-year-old daughter they just found out is terminal, and they're trying to figure out how to help her live through the rest of her days and decide what that looks like for this two-year-old. And friends, my heart breaks when I hear stories like that. Even though we know that God is in control, there is a certain frightening aspect to evil. There is a sense when we look at evil in the face, it's like looking at a frightening dragon that has the power to consume us. And at times, we're just not sure exactly how we should respond to that. And so in this second challenge, God comes to Job, and he doesn't shy away from the reality of evil. In fact, he characterizes evil in the form of these two different animals, these two illustrations. And he asks Job, Job, if you think you're so smart, if you think you could rule my world, if you think you could do justice better than me, then why don't you try? In fact, let's just try with a couple of my greatest creations. And so... Take your Bibles, if you will, in chapter 40, and let's look together, starting at verse 6. God addresses Job again and says, Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, Get ready to answer me like a man. When I question you, you will inform me. Would you really challenge my justice? And here in verses 8 and 9, we have the heart of Job's sin. As we've talked about before, Job was a righteous person. His sin did not cause his suffering. However, his suffering had caused him to sin. And here's the heart of Job's sin right here in these verses, verses 8 and 9. If you have a pen in hand, I'd encourage you to circle these verses in my Bible. I have written out here in the margins the key to Job's sin. I just write those little notes in there so that when I'm reading through Job the next time, I've got some cues to tell me what's going on. This is the the key now to Job's sin. God says to him, would you really challenge my justice? Would you declare me guilty to justify yourself? That's what Job did. Job has said to God, God, I'm fine. I'm not the issue. I'm righteous. And so if I'm not the issue, that means that you must have the problem, God. That's what Job said. And God puts his finger on that issue right here. Verse 8, would you declare me guilty to justify yourself? Verse 9, do you have an arm like God's? Can you thunder with a voice like His? And so God says, you want to try, Job? Okay, let's try for a second. You, You think you can do justice better than me? Then why don't you try for a minute? Why don't you put on my robes? Why don't you put on my judge's wig? Why don't you take the role of the judge of the universe for just a moment and see how well you can rule this universe? That's what he's going to say in verses 10 through 14. Look with me as I read. And again, we're going to read a lot of Scripture this morning because all of us want to know the answer to the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And here in these four chapters, God's actually speaking. And so if we want to know the answer, we better listen to what God has to say. And so we're going to read all of these chapters here this morning in our service together today. Look what it says in verse 10. Adorn yourself with majesty and splendor. Clothe yourself with honor. Put Put on the judge's robes, Job. Pour out your raging anger. Look on every proud person and humiliate them. Look on every proud person and humble them. Trample the wicked where they stand. Job, go ahead and try. Go ahead and pour out your righteous wrath on evil people. Hide them together in the dust. Imprison them in the grave. Then I will confess to you that your right hand can deliver you. You want to try your hand at this, Job? Go ahead and try. And at this point, verses 10 through 14, I'm reminded of a movie that was made quite a while ago called Bruce Almighty. Anybody else remember this movie with Jim Carrey? Ridiculous movie. He was a a newscaster. His name was Bruce Nolan. And he complained about God one too many times, and God comes and meets him. The The whole premise is ridiculous. It's blasphemous, obviously. You're seeing God in human form, and it's Morgan Freeman. I mean, of all the guys you could choose for God, I'm not sure why Morgan Freeman. But anyway... 
he always gets chosen to be the voice of God in these movies. And so he meets Bruce Nolan and says, oh, you think you can do God better than me? Why don't you try for a while? And he gives him powers. You remember this? And he gives him the powers of being God, and he tries, and for a while he's having fun with those powers, but the whole weight of the movie, the whole weight of the plot line is the comedic fact of his failure to be God, and he makes a royal mess out of everything. And that's essentially what God is saying here. This is, this is the seed for the plot line of Bruce Almighty right here. Job, you want to try it? Let me give you some power here and just see how well you're going to screw this up. I don't think you're going to do very well, Job. In fact, let's make it specific, Job. You think you could rule the universe? Why don't you just try to rule two of my greatest creations, two animals that I created? We come now into verse 15 and into chapter 41 as God describes two of his greatest creations. Now, I believe these are actual animals. There's some commentators that believe these are mythical beings. I think these are real animals just because of the way God talks about them. Look at verse 15. It says, look at behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like the cattle. Now, to me, that does not sound like he's talking about a mythical or mystical creature. He's actually pointing to a real creature. What kind of a creature is this? Well, we're not sure exactly. And at this point in the sermon, I want you to know we're treading on some dangerous ground here because we don't exactly know what these creatures are that God's talking about. And so the tendency and the temptation can be to try to chase this down and to focus more on this than the meaning of the passage. So please, I'm just encouraging you, don't get caught up in what these animals are. I'm, I'm going to kind of conclude on something, but we can get carried away with that, but we need to not get carried away and really focus in on what God's trying to tell Job here. So let's just try to think through maybe what animals he's talking about here. So he talks about this behemoth. Uh, we obviously don't have an animal named behemoth in our uh, language here. He says, look at the strength of his back, verse 16, the power in his muscles. Verse 17, he stiffens his tail like a cedar tree. And so this verse, verse 17, tells us that this animal, whatever this animal was, was huge, and it had a tail like a cedar tree. Now, again, I'm, I'm not really seeing any animals that I know of that have tails like cedar trees. It goes on in verse 17, the tendons of his thighs are woven firmly together. His bones are like bronze tubes. Now, you think about how large these bones would be. His limbs are like iron rods. Look at verse 19. He is the foremost of God's works. The foremost of God's works. Now, as people read through this, Again, they think it might be talking about a myth or a mystical creature. Some people think it's talking about an animal that we would still have today. And many commentators believe that God is talking about a hippopotamus here. Now, I don't take that tack exactly in the text because I just don't think a hippopotamus completely describes what we're dealing with here. A tail the size of a cedar tree. How many have you ever seen the tail of a hippopotamus before? It looks more like a little girl's curly cues on the side of her head, right? This little, small, thin little tail. It's definitely not like a cedar tree. When I think of a hippopotamus, also, verse 19, I don't think of an animal that's the foremost of God's works. When I see a hippopotamus, I'm like, whoa, and God, you just really outdid yourself with that, right? And it just doesn't really strike. I'm just not looking at hippopotamus in wonder, you know, he's just kind of this big, lumbering, oafy looking animal. I mean, it's big, but it's not like, wow. So whatever God's describing here, and Job knew what it was, God's describing a real animal. I don't think, my opinion, I don't think we have this animal. I think this is an extinct animal of today that was still around in Job's day. In fact, I believe this is probably a dinosaur that is still living. This is post-flood, uh, several years after the flood, maybe a couple hundred years after the flood, I believe that Noah took all the dinosaurs on the ark with him. It took a while for the world to adjust after the flood, for the climate to adjust. Lifespans were still long. Job lived to 210 years old. Abraham lived to 175 years old. So we still have long lifespans. The earth is still adjusting. The continents are separating at this point. Things are kind of in flux. And so there's this short window that dinosaurs potentially were still living after the flood along with Job and his friends. And so what kind of an animal could we be talking about here? Well, many commentators and biblical scientists believe that we may be talking about 
a dinosaur called the Brachiosaurus, and it looks something like this. You ever seen one of those before? The Brachiosaurus, a giant animal, weighing 90,000 pounds, 75 feet long, 40 feet tall. That is one giant lizard. How would you like to meet an animal like that? Now, interestingly enough, the Brachiosaurus was a vegetarian. My question, how do you get that big and be a vegetarian, right? Most vegetarians I know are skinny because they're eating vegetables. But look at that thing. And it says it right here in the text. Verse 15, look at behemoth which I made along with you. He eats the grass like the cattle. This huge animal, this wonder of God's work. And, and I, I would look at that and say, yeah, that, that, that is, that's amazing. Right? I would look at that and say, verse 19, he is the foremost of God's works. Of all the animals that God made, you could stand and be like, that's amazing. And it eats plants. Now, just to give you a perspective on how big this animal would be, here's a diagram for you. There's a person, and there's an elephant, and there's the Brachiosaurus. So we're talking about a very large animal the text calls the behemoth. Now let's read on in the text, starting in verse 20. It says, The hills yield food for him while all sorts of wild animals play there. He lies under the lotus plants, hiding the protection of marshy reeds. The lotus plants cover him with their shade. The willows by the brook surround him. Through the river rage, though the river rages, behemoth is unafraid. He remains confident even if the Jordan surges up to his mouth. Now look at verse 24. Can anyone capture him while he looks on or pierce his nose? with snares. Job, do you think you can rule the world? Do you think you can rule this universe better than I can? I would challenge you, Job, just try to capture and rule this one animal. And at this point, Job says, all right, God, you win, right? How can you do this? How can you put a ring around the nose of this animal and capture this animal? There's no way to capture this animal. It's so big. It's so massive. It's so imposing. There'd be no way to rule this, and Job fails here. If he wants to rule the universe, he's failed even at just ruling one of God's creations, the greatest of God's animal creations. Now we go on to chapter 41, and God brings up another animal as well, and we call this the Leviathan. Now there's even more mystery around what this is, and if you read the description of the Leviathan, it also is mysterious and kind of makes you wonder what's happening exactly and what kind of an animal this could be. Again, some people think it's mystical or mythical, and I don't, I don't think it is because of the great description that's given here in the text. Some believe it's an animal that was back in Job's day and is in our day as well, and we can match that up, but I'm not sure if it completely matches that. Some commentators believe that the Leviathan is a crocodile, now, I want you to just kind of listen to the text and tell me if you think this sounds like a crocodile. One of the things that it says here in the text is that this animal breathes out fire. Look at chapter 41, verse 18. His snorting flashes with light, and his eyes are like rays of dawn. Flaming torches shoot from his mouth. Does that sound like a crocodile to you? Look with me at verse 33. Again, this just doesn't sound like a crocodile to me. He has no equal on earth, a creature devoid of fear. He surveys everything that is haughty. He is the king over all the proud beasts. Crocodile? I'm not sure. I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is because this is like the culmination of the book of Job. God is pointing to this animal as the culmination. I just don't think a crocodile really culminates God's point. This isn't the greatest closing argument if it's a crocodile. So what are we talking about here? Well, I happen to believe, and there's many commentators also believe along with me, that we're talking about, again, a, a, a dinosaur type of an animal and probably what you would consider to be a dragon. Now you're like, all right, I didn't come to church today to talk about weird things like this, and don't worry, I'm not going to pull the Dungeons and Dragons board out here and do any role play or anything like that. It's not, it's not going to get weird, but I think there's something, some kind of a dinosaur that was like a dragon, a fire-breathing animal. Could there really have been something like that? Well, let me just point to a couple things in nature that exists today. There's this little beetle. Anybody ever heard of this beetle called the bombardier beetle? Anybody ever heard of that before? It's a beetle that has a built-in defense system that it mixes together 
some chemicals inside of it, and when it's in danger, it shoots out an explosion of chemicals that's hotter than boiling water. And this is a chemical reaction, like an explosive chemical reaction. It shoots out of its backside. Some of you are like my kids, have that exact same talent, right? Some of you wives are like my husband. No, we're not going to go there this morning. My husband's a bombardier beetle. Now, that's actually in creation, a little beetle that has that ability. You think of uh, in the summertime here in Iowa, lightning bugs. When we would come on vacation in the Midwest, we didn't have lightning bugs in Colorado. I just thought those were the coolest things, you know, to see those lightning bugs. That is a chemical reaction. It's like a combustion inside the body of that animal that creates the light. It's fascinating. Could there have been, like the bombardier beetle or the lightning bug, could there have been an animal that could mix chemicals together that could actually breathe fire? I don't think that's outside the realm of possibility. And what God's doing here is He's pointing to a creature that is so terrifying, so scary, so amazing. And it's the culmination of His case against Job. Job, you think you can rule the world? Try the behemoth. You can't even come close to capturing the behemoth. How about the Leviathan? Everybody's afraid of the Leviathan, the dragon because of how scary it is. And what we have going on here in chapter 41 is he's talking about a real animal. I think, it, I think it's like a dragon. But he's also kind of fusing this into a symbol of evil as well. And I don't think it's any mistake that throughout the Scriptures, Satan is referred to as a dragon. I think the dragon was a real animal that as the biblical writers wrote, they used that as a symbol then for evil. It says in Isaiah chapter 27 that this dragon lives in the sea and Further in the Scriptures, we hear Satan referred to as a dragon. I'm going to talk about that here later in the sermon, but there's this symbol now of evil, and I think what God's doing to Job is He's making him confront, in the form of this animal, He's making him confront evil. And God says, Job, if you think you can reign in evil, if you think you can rule evil, then why don't you start with the symbol of evil and try your hand at putting a harness and a bit and a bridle on that dragon and see how well you can do with that. If you can do that, Job, I'll step aside and you can have my judge's robes. Let's look how he describes this animal. This is amazing. Again, so much description. I, if it's talking about a mythical creature, I just don't know why there's so much description here. Look what it says. Verse, verse 1 of chapter 41. Can you pull in Leviathan with a hook or tie his tongue down with a rope? Can you put a cord through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he beg you for mercy or speak softly to you? What's God saying? God's saying, Job, are you able to put a leash around the neck of this dragon? Are you able to pull it into submission so it says, oh, ow, Job, sorry, Job, I'll serve you, Job. Just bleed that hurt really bad, Job. Can you do that? I think one of the possible titles of this sermon could have been How to Train Your Dragon this morning, right? That's what these verses are saying. Job, do you think you could train this dragon? Do you think you could get on this dragon and use it for your purposes? He goes on, I love verse 5. This is just really... A picturesque language here in verse 5. He says, Can you play with him like a bird or put him on a leash for your girls, for your daughters? And imagine Job coming home. Hey, kids, I bought a pet. <gasps> really? What is it? Why don't you come out back and see? Kids come down. Kids coming down the stairs, go out the back door, open the sliding glass door, and there is a dragon. Oh! Thanks. The girl comes and hugs the dragon, and the dragon gets upset and bursts out a flame and burns the entire house down and kills the family. That's dark humor, isn't it? But that's what verse 5 is saying. You think you're going to take this dragon and make a pet out of it? You think you're going to be able to do that, Job? I, I don't think so. He goes on in the text. Look with me at verse 6. Will traders bargain for him or divide among the merchants? Can you fill his hide with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay a hand on him. Will you remember the battle and never repeat it? Any hope of capturing him proves false. Does a person not collapse at the very sight of him? No one is ferocious enough to rouse Leviathan. Then who can stand against me? Who confronted me that I should repay him? Everything under heaven belongs to me. If you have a pen in hand, mark verse 11. Because this is, again, where God is saying to Job, 
You're facing the representation of pure evil, unbridled evil, wild and uncontrolled evil. But Job, I want you to know, verse 11, that everything under heaven, including evil, including Satan himself, lives in my house. And therefore, I control him. I love verse 11. Even though it seems so uncontrolled and so scary and so difficult, never forget, it all lives in my house. Verse 12, I cannot be silent about his limbs, his power, his graceful proportions. Who can strip off his outer covering? Who can penetrate his double layer of armor? Who can open his jaws surrounded by those terrifying teeth? His pride is in his rows of scale, closely sealed together. One scale is so close to another that no air can pass between them. They're joined to one another so closely connected they cannot be separated. Now in verse 18, we talk about what he does in snorting fire. Again, people that believe this is a crocodile say, well, a crocodile comes up from the water and he like sprays out mist and it looks like smoke. Now you tell me if that is an adequate description of what's going on here in verses 18 through 21. His snorting flashes with light while his eyes are like rays of dawn. Flaming torches shoot from his mouth. Fiery sparks fly out. Smoke billows from his nostrils from a boiling pot or burning reeds. His breath sets coals ablaze and flames pour out of his mouth. Yeah, that's probably just a crocodile emerging out from the water, right? I don't think so. We're talking about a terrifying creature. Kids, this is fun today, isn't it? You didn't know you were going to get a little lesson in dragons this morning. This is a good time. Look what it says, starting in verse 22. Strength resides in his neck, and dismay dances before him. The folds of his flesh are joined together. Solid as metal and immovable. His heart is hard as a rock, as hard as a mil lower millstone. Verse 25 and following is what happens when people try to contend with this animal. When Leviathan rises, the mighty are terrified. They withdraw because of his thrashing. The sword that reaches him will have no effect, nor will a spear, a dart, or an arrow. He regards iron as straw, and bronze as rotten wood. No arrow can make him flee. Sling stones become like stubble to him. A club is regarded as stubble. He laughs at the sound of the javelin. This animal has such strength it takes iron and just can crack it like a piece of straw. Verse 30, his undersides are a jagged pot shared, spreading the mud like threshing sledge. He makes the depth seethe like a cauldron. He makes the sea like an ointment jar. He leaves a shining wake behind him. One would think the deep had gray hair. He has no equal on earth, a creature devoid of fear. He surveys everything that is haughty. He is king over all the proud beasts, the dragon. And so we have a real animal, a real creature. And God is saying, Job, you want to try to rule the world? You want to try to rule the universe? You want to try to give justice to evil and face this issue of evil? Why don't you try? Why don't you try just to try to rein in even this, the symbol of evil. And I think what God is doing here in just a brilliant stroke is talking about a real animal, but he's also talking about evil and personifying evil and personifying Satan in some ways as well because we have this idea of a dragon, of a real animal, but then there's this vision of a dragon as well. And that's more the vision that you see and you think about with Satan who rages against God and rages against us, God's people. And what Job is learning here and what God is teaching Job is that there is evil in the world and it seems scary and it seems out of control and it's not something that we have the power to control, but God still ultimately is in control. And if you remember back at the beginning of the book of Job, Satan comes to God and talks to God and wagers with God and there's a conversation going on and I think that Satan has watched this entire time that he has been there watching Job, hoping that Job is going to sin and God knows that Satan is still listening now. And so here God is describing to Job, this dragon, 
And he knows Satan is listening in. And what God's actually doing as well is he's describing Satan himself. And God makes a clear statement to Satan in chapter 41, verse 11, and says, everything under heaven belongs to me. And God's making a statement to Satan. As Satan's listening in, Satan, don't think you're so smart. Don't think you're so sly because I still have control over you. And I love how God paints that. It's like God says, I have a leash. Satan, whenever I want to, I can take that leash. I have you on a chain and I can yank you back and make you stay in line if I want to. And I think Job is getting that picture as well, that evil may seem out of control, evil may seem like it's running rampant in this world, but God still is on the throne, and God holds the chain of Satan in his hand and has Satan on a leash that he cannot escape from. And friends, that's comforting to know. That is comforting to know in our lives because there's so many times that we face the dragon. There's so many times that we face the evil of sin and the difficulty of all the sin and the suffering in this world. But it's so comforting to know that ultimately, chapter 41, verse 11, everything under heaven belongs to God, that God holds the chain of the leash of Satan himself. And someday, my friends, someday, God's going to have the final victory In Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12, we have kind of the finishing of this imagery about Satan being the dragon. It says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels also fought, but he could not prevail, and there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to the earth. And his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come because the accuser of the brothers and sisters has been thrown down. And friends, that's going to happen someday. And God has control and he has control now and he's going to vanquish Satan for good. Martin Luther talked about it in terms like this in his great hymn, A mighty fortress is our God. He says, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to unto us, we will not fear. For God has willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. You know how I'm anxious to see that someday when Jesus Christ comes back and a sword proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ and he vanquishes his enemy forever. Friend, it's no reason why many Christians are in despair about God's working in the world. Job wanted to know. Job wanted to have answers about evil in the world, and God didn't give him an answer. God pointed him to creation. It's no wonder why we're in despair, why Christians are in despair about the world, because we are told over and over again in our schools, in our society, and in science centers, we're told over and over again that this world is just an accident, that this world is evolving, that everything that happened here in the world just happened, and it's just kind of going on with no control. And what God does in these chapters, what God does to Job is he points to creation. He points to the specificity of creation. And friend, I want to tell you this morning, the doctrine of believing that God created the world is not just a side doctrine. It's not just a tertiary doctrine. It is a core doctrine because it gets to the heart of who God is. He created the world with specificity. He created it and designed it the way that he wanted it. And friend, I want a God like that. I want a creation like that. I want to know that this didn't just happen, that this just isn't evolving in some out of control way, but it is here by design. And the fact that we can know a designer personally and that he designed things intentionally brings comfort to our hearts when we go through life's difficult trials. I want you to see this morning as God continues to talk to Job, he's saying to Job, God, uh, Job, I am just and wise. I am just and wise. You can trust my justice. You can trust my wisdom because I've both ordained and I'm going to defeat evil someday. So, Job, I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm not going to tell you all the answers as to why there's evil in this world. I'm not going to tell you the answer why I allowed evil into this world. But what I am going to tell you is that I am God. I am in control. I specifically designed this. I have Satan on a leash, and I am just and I am wise in both ordaining and defeating evil someday. 
because I am the Creator God. If you think with me for just a moment about the creation, the kind of comfort that we receive from the creation, and I know it doesn't always seem like things are really ordered in this world, that maybe it seems like things are out of control, but God is in control, and you just have to look to His creation to see that as God pointed to His creation to Job. He said, Job, look at the creation, and you tell me, am I a God that is letting things out of control? Just think of one aspect of His creation, the human eye. Sometimes it's creepy to look at an eye that close, isn't it? You can just imagine something poking that thing, just, ugh. I don't even know why I said that. It just is kind of creepy, but the eye, eyes freak me out. You know, just stuff that happens to the eyes is just kind of creepy because there's so much going on with the eye. You know, even with his limited knowledge, Charles Darwin, the person that came up with the ridiculous theory of evolution, said that the eye, of all things, the eye caused him to doubt his theory of evolution more than anything. Why? Because in the eyeball, there are approximately 7 million cells that are cones. And each one of those cells is loaded to fire off a message to the brain when light hits its path. Those cones are responsible for color vision and work best in bright light. The other cells in the eye are called rods, and they work almost primarily at nighttime for night vision. The human eye with the 7 million different cells receive millions of reports simultaneously from the eye cell and the brain absorbs those, sorts it, and organizes it into the images that we see. And that all happens like that. That's what's happening every millisecond when your eyes are open, taking in information, processing. The brain is sorting that ordering it, creating images that we see. Friend, when you look at things like that, when you look at the design that's in the universe, what that says to me is there's a designer who cares about us. And nothing in this creation is out of control. It doesn't answer all the questions. It doesn't help us come to grips with the fact of why God allowed evil into this world. But what it does help us with and what God's done here in these chapters is He's pointed out to Job, Job, I am more in control of this creation than you could ever imagine. Job, just try to reign in two of my greatest creations and see how well you can do. And Job comes to the end and says, I can't do it at all. And God says, I know. I'm in control. I have Satan on a leash. He can't go any further than I'm going to let him go. He can't go any further than he's been appointed to go. And what's so great about us versus what Job had, Job had limited vision. Friend, we have greater vision than Job does because we can see now a little bit more of God's plan. We can see exactly how God is going to sink the dagger into the neck of that dragon someday. And it started at the cross of Calvary. When Jesus Christ disarmed the power of that dragon by taking the penalty for our sins and giving us a righteous standing before God, he completely stripped the dragon of all of his power. And someday God's going to finish that job. So why did God allow it? We don't know all the answers to those questions. But one thing we do know is that God allowed it for his purpose, for his glory, to show himself as being the just and wise ruler that he is thought of an illustration this week, and I, I hesitate to even say this illustration because it involves the Kansas City Chiefs. Cole was asleep until I said that this morning. I'm kidding. As you know, they just won the Super Bowl a couple of weeks ago after a 50-year drought. I saw grown men in our church cry when they won the Super Bowl. Now, let me just ask you the reaction of people. Let's say that this would have been the third Super Bowl in a row the Chiefs had won. Let's say this was the third one in a row. What would the reaction been like if this was the third one in the row? I don't think the reaction would have been the same. I don't think it would have been nearly as dramatic. I don't think you would have seen grown men cry for a third year in a row. If this would have been the third time in a row, the reaction would have been much different. Why was the reaction so strong? Why was the rejoicing so jubilant? 
when the Chiefs won the Super Bowl this year. Why? Because after 50 years, after 50 years of being losers, <laughs> right, the victory is just so, so sweet, isn't it? After 50 years of one losing season after another, many of those losing seasons at the hands of the Denver Broncos, over and over again, Finally, man, it is so sweet. Now, just think of that for a minute. If there's no Satan, there's no cross. If there's no cross, there's no seeing the glory of a loving God who sacrifices himself for us. If there's no cross and there's no salvation, there's no final victory. And someday that victory is going to be sweet as we are in an arena, like a Super Bowl arena, cheering on our God and Savior as he takes the sword and beheads that dragon for all of eternity. And we can stand in our seats and weep and cheer and cry out in joy as God defeats Satan. Why can we cry out in joy so much? Because we all tasted the suffering of pain and sin in this world. And because we felt that, it will make the victory so much sweeter. Job says why. We say why. God says you don't need to know why. What you do need to know is that I'm in control and you can trust me.